Hello, my name is Alan Reich. I'm Professor of Scottish Literature at the University of Glasgow. And in this uh, presentation for the Association for Scottish Literary Studies uh, Education uh, Conference, or set of presentations in lieu of a conference, I'm talking now in this session about Edwin Morgan. Edwin Morgan, uh, as in an international context, the status of Edwin Morgan internationally, as I see it, his stature in terms of the, the world of the 20th century through which he lived, from his birth in 1920 to his death in 2010, so I should say the 20th and the, into the 21st centuries, because perhaps no poet anywhere has taken us so closely across that period of time from when he started writing seriously and publishing in the aftermath of the Second World War through the 50s, 60s, 70s, into the latter part of the 20th century, but into that first decade of the 21st in which a world of technology, mass media and online communication, artificial intelligence or what we call virtual reality is commonplace. No poet, I think, has tracked his own changing times through revolutionary politics in the early 20th century, through space travel in the mid to late 20th century, to computers and IT and the imagination that is unleashed by virtual reality. Reality is primary. But virtual reality is not to be denied. It's now part of reality. And Morgan, I think, gives us a guide to that, an introduction to that, in a way that no other poet really does. Most of the great poets of his generation, great Scottish poets of his generation, are rural. They come from the islands, the highlands, the borders, the countryside. I'll come back and touch on this again in a moment. But I think Morgan is exceptional in his sense of belonging, sense of familiarity, and sense of um, pleasure in Glasgow particularly, but in the city more generically. It's true that Robert Garriach and Sidney Goodser Smith in Edinburgh and Norman McCaig to some extent were familiar with Edinburgh as a city, but Edinburgh is old. Wherever you go in Edinburgh, it's old. There's the old town and there's the new town, but the new town is old. And there's always that sense of the historical depth of Edinburgh. Glasgow is always changing. Uh, it's old, for sure. It's ancient. Absolutely it is. But there's always that sense, and Morgan experienced it, particularly in the 1960s, that it's renewing itself constantly, that there's always a sense of engagement, um, a sense of uh, things don't stay the same, or as he put it himself, change rules. That's to say, change rules. But then change rules. He says change rules is the supreme graffito. Um, he's aware of this. He's aware of change as a living principle. And the energy of it, the defiance of it, is part of his character. And that goes into his sense of play. He once uh, commented, he was asked for a, for a comment uh, to be printed on the back of a, a little anthology of Glasgow poetry. Uh, and he wrote this. Uh, for that purpose, and I don't think it's ever been published anywhere else in terms of its own identity. It's not a poem, it's not a, it's not a particular aspect, a, a particular publication. It's just a wee back cover sentence. And what he says is, um, Glasgow is the best of plays. You can watch it and act in it at the same time. Well, I'll extend that further. Isn't that, what, isn't that life and creation and the whole of it? all the world. You watch it. You watch it closely. And whether you're watching it as you're walking around, literally, physically watching, or whether you're watching it literally, physically, but on television or on screen, through media, virtually, virtual reality and reality are the same world that we inhabit now. So the best of plays, well, that also involves changing the rules sometimes. A few years ago, well, a number of years ago now, a long time ago actually, Edwin Morgan visited New Zealand and he went down into, I was with him 
when we went down into, we visited a famous tourist site called the Waitomo Caves. Waitomo Caves are a sequence of caves. Uh, you go in deeper and deeper into the, the limestone. And in the deepest one, you're invited to go on a boat on an underground river. And all is dark. And the guides with their torches tell you not to make a sound because the lights that you see are actually um, glow worms in the dark. And as the boat drifts out onto the water and is taken down the stream in the current, the lights above you are like constellations. Morgan wrote about this in an essay called A Roof of Fireflies. He said when he visited um, the Waitomo underground caves, it's a remarkable and beautiful sight. Like any other visitor, I found it thrilling. But somehow it was more than thrilling. It was moving. It was saying things that only things can say. And my mind kept recurring to it for days and months afterwards. I can feel a tingling even while I write about it now. But if what I said could be put in a letter, I'm not going to open the envelope. I've not written a poem about it. It might well come into a poem if it does so unawares with no moralizing or piling up of analogies. It's a very interesting perception that the experience of things saying things that only th saying s saying things that only thing can, things can say. Let me get the actual words again. Here are here are things that only things can say. If it, if it, if if the imagery creeps into a poem, all well and good but it can't be manufactured, it can't be designed in that way. There's something about it that has to be spontaneous and immediate and profound. Except that now we're looking back over Edwin Morgan's life. Um, as I say, he died in 2010. And when we consider him, first of all, in the scale of his achievement, and then what I'll go on to do is put him in various contexts, internationally and nationally, and think of that stature, that status that he has, his character, in that broader, broader context. But when you think of his biography, I think, in terms of his writing, I think we can um, discern five lives, five stages, five lives. It's almost as if they are five lives. It's almost as if he reinvents himself or mutates or metamorphoses into uh, a different character. Not a different character but a person, a poet, writing with different priorities. Let me outline, outline them for you. The first one might be um, uh, introduced by a wee book called The Vision of Kafkan Braes. It's a priority of two things. One is it's a vision. It's a romantic conception of being able to see beyond the visible or beyond the scene to, the, to what's really visible beyond that. But it's of Cathkin Braes. Cathkin Braes are the, the, the hills in the south side of Glasgow, which, with which he was very familiar, um, having grown up in that neck of the woods, um, being born there. One of the poems in it, which is in the new centenary selected poems published in 2020 for, uh, for Morgan's centenary year, is a poem called Verses for a Christmas Card. Let me read the beginning. This end year starnacht blach and klar as I on Kathkin fells held far, a snapus fushpaw shower down with nezhni schmurl and whirl come round upon my pole bare underlift and smazzled all my gaze with shift. Far o'er fields wide, for os bloom strafling, floral brookrims hoarthracked glassling, all air clue, bowhaven above, avalanche bloom fond showed, Brumal Jove. Just the opening of a poem where he's playing with language, he's playing with words, with the meanings of words, of different languages, bringing them in, Scots and Russian, and all kinds of uh, images are brought together and sort of crushed together, clumped together in ways that are celebrative and festive and pleasurable and curious and fun. It's real in the sense of it being uh, about, refers to Kathkin Fells, Kathkin Braes, a real place. You see it on the map, go there and visit it. But it's a vision and it's a play, it's a game with words, with language, with how words work, how perception works. But 
That's one side of this first life. The other side of it is a poem, a uh, translation, in fact, called Beowulf, from the Old English poem. And this is a, a poem um, which was very successful. It was published by the University of California Press and became a set text um, as the translation of Beowulf uh, that was used for decades. And it's very grim and dark and full of war and violence and fighting and frustration and uh, thwart, what Shakespeare calls bias and thwart, about energies that cannot be released. That little poem, the Christmas poem I just read, is full of energies being released, controlled but released. That first life of Morgan, I think, had more to do with the bias, the thwart, the frustration. Being gay, growing up in Glasgow in Scotland, going to war, and uh, finding the homosocial experience of that liberating strangely, but the whole experience of war itself, such as he wasn't on the front line, as it were, but he saw death at close hand. And he couldn't write about it directly at that time. He came to write about it retrospectively. In the 1970s, a long poem called The New Divan, fantastic poem, um, but full of that density of retrospect. But in that first era, in the 1950s, up through into the early 1960s, he was really trying to find, a, find what he could do and where he would be. He studied here at Glasgow University. He became a professor of English here after the war when he came back. The professor at that time, the um, chair of the English department, uh, Edwin Morgan told me, uh, walked with him around the professor's quadrangle, um, harumphing in a professorial way and said, uh, Morgan, you've done quite well. Um, would you like to join us? And so he thought, yes, this is a good idea. He had an option of going to study at Oxford and doing research uh, in England, but he wanted to stay here. He wanted to work in Glasgow, in Scotland, and to teach. And it was partly a practical commitment to Glasgow and to Scotland, but it was also a sense of being able to talk to other people using language that was familiar and then seeing what could be made of it. And then the 1960s happened, and Morgan's second life, you might say, um, is um, signalled in the breakthrough volume of his career, and the breakthrough of well, the first breakthrough volume of his career, and the breakthrough volume um, for that era in Scottish poetry, Scottish literature. This is it, first edition, Second Life. Literally, it's called The Second Life, published in 1968. Uh, beautifully designed. This is becoming a little ragged around the edges now, um, but I've had it for a long time. And uh, it's full of uh, lyrical, autobiographical poems, but poems that have this international reach. He talks about Marilyn Monroe alongside Hugh McDermott or Ian Hamilton Finlay. He talks about um, a Hungarian snake, a wonderfully humorous poem uh, in in, in sections of the book are in different, uh, diff slightly different colours. And the poem uh, called The Siesta of a Hungarian Snake is simply one line. I'm not sure if you can focus in on that, but uh, um, we, can, we, can, we can just imagine what it must have been like to look at first. The two letters, S, Z, Hungarian uh, vocabulary, Hungarian alphabet, uh, Hungarian sounds perhaps. But the design of the, of the text is a lowercase letters rising to higher case and then coming down to a lowercase again. So it's almost as if you have a, a python or, a, or an anaconda, but it's a Hungarian snake and it's, digest it's just swallowed a deer or something big and it's digesting its meal and it's having a siesta and after, after dinner snooze. And the sounds that it's making... <laughs> size of the letters echo the volume of the sound and the sound of the sound echoes the Hungarian aspect of the letters and the imagery of the snake having a sleep on the flat on the ground is there in the visual representation all of these aspects of it are, are connecting not only through language with uh, Hungary um, but also through um, contemporary experimentation in the 1960s with sound poetry and with um, 
the visual elements of poetry and minimalist poems and poems that can be of only one word, the title can be any length. Um, all of this play, all of this experimentation was very much what he was characterised by um, at, in that era. One of the other books of that time is called Instamatic Poems. And in this he takes images from the news or from things that are just immediately happening internationally all over the world and, and gives you the, um, the words for them. Uh, two of the most moving, I think, I've always gone back to, is one called Venice, April 1971, where he describes a gondola funeral taking place in Venice. And in the, on the gondola going down um, the, the water, the waterway, is the corpse of Igor Stravinsky, the great composer, the great modernist composer. And towards the end of the poem, he says, at the edge of the picture, there's an old poet standing there with white hair and hooded, piercing eyes leaning on his stick, without expression, watching the boat move out from his shore. And this is Ezra Pound in Venice, the great modern poet, great modernist poet, very, very volatile, well, very volatile in what he wrote and what he said, what he did, actually. Very dangerous character in some ways, very serious character in some ways, but a great poet, nevertheless, whatever his politics. And Morgan just takes a snapshot of an era of international modernism. Stravinsky, Russian, a great piece of music, The Rite of Spring, subtitled, Pictures from Pagan Russia. Ezra Pound, the American, who goes to Italy, goes, writes and uses Chinese characters in his poetry and his cantos, but travels throughout Europe and London and that sense of an international reach is right there in Morgan's poetry. The other one that I love from this sequence is called Nigeria, undated, reported, October 1971. He sees a, an Englishman in a Land Rover driving north has reached the Niger. He says, halt, it's, a sign says halt, no photographs. He gets out and looks and he sees a, a herd of cattle being driven across a bridge. And it's just a, 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 an image until at the bottom of the poem, at the end of the poem, he says, there's a white plinth on the bank, like some great animal's cast tooth, and it marks Mungo Park. Mungo Park, the explorer of Africa, uh, who went there um, in the 19th century. And, um, oh, they, well, actually, um, the early 19th century, and, uh, and came from the borders, I think. Um, what I'm trying to get at is the international imagination of Morgan is at work in, his po in the poems of this um, second life, the second stage of his life. Uh, he's closing in on locality. There is a sequence called the Glasgow Sonnets, uh, there's a, but there's also a book called From Glasgow to Saturn. So he's looking outwards all the time. If there, as Hugh McDermott put it somewhere, if there is anything in Scotland that is worth having, there is no distance to which it is unattached. So there's no sense of the parochial no sense of, the, of, the, of this is all there is. There's every sense of looking around closely, but there's also that sense of look as far and wide as you can because you'll find things to learn from and to enjoy and play with, be part of. Then there's what I would call the third life. Um, it begins in the 1980s and it's centered on this book, Sonnets from Scotland, 1984. This comes in the aftermath of 1979, which we all remember, those of us who do, historically or actually, if we were, if we were there, uh, a year in which uh, um, a vote for devolution of some kind was successful but torpedoed. Um, and a vote UK-wide, which put Margaret Thatcher and the Conservative Party in charge of the government in London. In the wake of that, through the 80s and 90s, there was a whole series of books and research projects and work undertaken by scholars and creative writers and artists of all kinds. Alistair Gray's Lanark, his great novel, Liz Lochhead's play, Mary Queen of Scots Got Her Head Chopped Off, and Edwin Morgan's Sonnets from Scotland. These are part of that movement. But Morgan's, I think, is central to it. Um, the, the, the plot of the book is that, um, not international, but intergalactic and interstellar and intertemporal time travellers 
come to Scotland from before it begins and leave, well, before or after it ends. And they find all kinds of things, things that have never happened, things that might happen. They imagine a, uh, an artist in, a, in an airplane, the granddaughter of the conceptual artist Crystal, dropping a sheet of plastic, Scotland shaped and Scotland sized, over Scotland. What would that do? No more rain. And <laughs> birds, sparrows, whatever, just bouncing off it. And all kinds of imaginative things happen. Visitors come to Scotland. Edgar Allan Poe, great American writer, horror writer, mystery writer, goes to school in Scotland, which he did. He's in, 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 in the sequence. And the, the, the central poem, the, the, first, the poem that was first written, is called uh, The Solway Canal, where he imagines an independent Scotland defined its border with England, not by guns and passports and officers of the law, but by a wonderful man-made waterway, humanly created, I should say, waterway, with boats rolling up and down it. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a serious statement about independence, but it's also a statement about travel and passage through and across and over such borders there, as there are. Sonnets from Scotland centres Morgan's attention on Scotland as a national poet. Previously, in the second life of the second life, he had been so well known as a playful poet, giving voices to the hyena or the apple or the Loch Ness Monster. There's a much more, the, the play element is still there, but it's much more um, committed and invested in the regeneration of using the imagination to see Scotland differently. There's a transition then to the third life, you might say. Uh, sorry, to the fourth life. So the first one is Beowulf and Kafka and Braes. The second one is the second life and the playful poems taking you through to the new divan, Glasgow to Saturn. The third one is the sonnets from Scotland from the video box. And the virtual and other realities book is what takes you into the fourth life. And it starts with Demon in 1999. This is the era of the turn of the century, the turn of the millennium. And again, he's identifying particular energies and seeing them also not only just as play, they had, he had always seen them as potentially dark as well, human potential at its worst, human potential at its best. But within both, there's a sense of energy. And the demon is the carrier of that energy. He's the, he transmits it. Um, and it just begins, uh, first poem in the sequence is, um, My job is to rattle the bars. It's a battle. The gates are high, large, long, hard, black. Whatever the metal is, it is asking to be struck. There are guards, of course, but I am very fast, and within limits I can change my shape. The dog watches me, but I'm not trying to get out, nor am I trying to get in. He growls if I lift my iron shaft. I smile at that, and with a sudden whack, I drag it lingeringly and resoundingly along the gate. Then he's berserk. Fine. So it's a demonic drive. It's an energy that um, can animate things, people to do some of the worst things, but some of the best things too. And Morgan is understanding that in a way, I think, that's new. This takes him through to his attention in, to Glasgow, concentrated on a book called Cafuris, which is the oldest uh, name we know of for Glasgow, but it also takes him um, to a trilogy of plays called AD, Trilogy of Plays on the Life of Jesus Christ, which got him into trouble from all kinds of quarters. But he's imagining the story of Christ as a human being in an historical period and imagining that through drama. And the parables that are being told in that series of plays have direct bearing upon this sense of him, Morgan, at the turn of the millennium, at the turn of the century, um, writing this, writing Cathuris, um about Glasgow and the people of Glasgow, writing a sequence called Love and a Life, and a, another um, play called the play of Gilgamesh, based on the oldest known uh, written uh, inscribed text that we know of in history. Finally, the last decade of his life, Beyond the Sun, the poems that he wrote uh, to paintings in the Glasgow, in the Herald newspaper, when it was um, when it asked for its readers to nominate um, 
their favourite paintings, a whole sequence of paintings, uh, were, were, were named, and Eddie, Eddie wrote a poem for each of them. And the very last one is a, is a, po a painting by Joan Erdley. Um, I'm not sure again if you can see that. It's just a painting about a, of a breaking wave. Uh, Morgan described it. He'd written about Joan Erdley before, and he owned a painting of Joan Erdley's, and he knew, he, he, he knew what her work was about. But he imagines her painting it on the seashore at Catherland, on the east coast. And there are bits of grass coming over and sticking to the painting. But it's the energy, that energy, that almost demonic energy that comes through in the poem as well. It ends. A solitary clover, unable to read wet paint, rolls over once or twice, then it's fixed. Part of a field more human than the one that took the gale and is now as she is. Beyond the Sun. That's it, that's the title, so we'll give the book the title, Beyond the Sun. And it's there in that last decade of his life, he culminates it with a book that was published on his last birthday called Dreams and Other Nightmares, The Dark Side, The Aspirational Side, it's all there. That, and, and finally, just let me note before I come to the last part of what I want to say, in, uh, on his 80th birthday, um, we, uh, a number of us uh, contributed to a little anthology of poems dedicated to him. And he wrote a poem himself, uh, for himself, at 80, which begins, Push the boat out, compañeros. Push the boat out, whatever the sea. Poetry is like a spaceship, he said. That kind of optimistic sense of voyaging, travelling out into the world, coming back to Glasgow. I think that characterises him... Um, uh, generally, his writing career in those five stages. But I think what I would like to do in the last few minutes, five minutes or so uh, remaining to me, is to, do, is to place him in these contexts. I want to do this very briefly. Um, first of all, by noting that I'm talking to you in the centenary year of his, uh, of his birth. Um, it's ten years since his death. Um, he was a friend and a great encourager of me and many others. And many events had been planned to celebrate uh, this year, which have had to be postponed because of the circumstances. But one that's gone ahead is the production of a new, as I mentioned, a centenary selected poems, a new anthology of his poems, and a new um, collection of five little books, uh, selected selecteds, of poems by Edwin Morkin on particular themes. And I think it's worth noting those themes, the characteristics that are that is that scholars, readers, and friends have identified as priorities in Morkin's work. Love, just as a subject, as an actual subject. You think of Burns as a great love poet, and indeed he is, and a great writer of love songs. Um, there are others, Pablo Neruda, great love poet. But love as a main theme in poetry puts him into an international context where great love poets of other countries and other ages can be, can be put alongside him and he stands the comparison. Poems like Trio, uh, just those, that great festive poem, Of Love. Poems um, like uh, the one where he imagines Catherine the Great uh, writing a letter to Robert Burns. Uh, we'll have him over here in Russia. I'd like to get to know this man, she says. Poems like Strawberries, Let the Storm Wash the Plates. We have a feast to come, you know, that sense of it. And the last sequence, towards the end of his, of his life, in the last book, uh, uh, towards the end of his life, um, in the last book published by Karkinek called The uh, Book of Lives, a sequence of poems called Love and a Life. Second theme, Scotland. Great playful poems like Canadolia, where he mixes up the place names of Scotland and, and uh, turns them into a, a, a game where you have to find them. Where are they? What do you know of Scotland? Find out about it. The Solway Canal that I mentioned. Or the lines for Wallace when he was asked to write about William Wallace, the guardian of Scotland. In the aftermath of Braveheart, the film, almost as a kind of corrective to Braveheart, the film. And he said, no, I don't want to do that. I don't, I don't feel like I should write about William Wallace. 
And then a few days later, he wrote back to the editors and said, no, wait a minute, I've thought about it, I do. And the first lines of that poem, lines for Wallace, are, surely it is better to forget. It is better not to forget. And then he takes you into the whole world of it. So Scotland is a theme. People and places of all sorts and all varieties all over the world. Great poem about Istanbul. Um, great poem about individual characters. Great poems about individual characters. Portraits and landscapes. In the Glasgow book, Cathures, there's a, a, a sequence of poems called Nine in Glasgow, Nine People, beginning with Pelagius, the Pelagian heresy. Pelagius was a character who said there is no such thing as original sin. And Morgan said that's true. And the poem is a kind of embodiment of this character who, whose name, Pelagius, is related to the meaning of the ocean, the word ocean, what a sea is voyaging, as is Morgan's, more, mer, Morgan, the sea, Pelagius. Great portrait poem. And animals, the hyena, the Hungarian snake, we'll not notice the, the Loch Ness Monster. Um, and space, science fiction, for the first men on Mercury, very famous exchange of language which takes you to another world. I think uh, one of the things I'd recommend is the Edwin Morgan Trust website. Simply as we are using the technology these days, that is a, a great resource for so much more of this. Morgan and his contemporaries, I mentioned um, the Scottish uh, poets that, uh, of his generation, but if you put him in that international and national context, both looking into the depth of history and to the breadth of geography. In Scotland, you might go right back to the Makers, um, Robert Henryson, William Dunbar, Gavin Douglas, and notice that Edwin Morgan was appointed as effectively Poet Laureate of Scotland as a Macker of Scotland. That's the word that is being used now. So Edwin Morgan was followed by Liz Lochhead, as we know, and currently the, the Scots Macker is Jackie Kay. But Morgan was the first of the modern Makers, but if you look back to the original Makers, as it were, you find so many things to uh, make comparisons and contrasts. Um, Henryson, Testament of Cressid, that sense of compassion for the woman, that sense of the, no, the nature of human tragedy in a world of implacable gods, inhuman gods, the, 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 the ancient gods that are evoked in that poem and the rigidities of law and the church that Henryson sets on one side against the humanity of, of Cressid. But William Dunbar, language at play again, but full of form, strict form and energy. Edwin Morgan has an essay where he talks about that relationship between energy and form in Dunbar. And Gavin Douglas, the great translator of uh, Virgil, the Aeneid becomes the Aeneidos in, in Gavin Douglas's version. And in it, in, published in 1513, you find the first instance of the word wow. When you say the word wow, wow, you're speaking an old Scots word. And it seems awfully appropriate that Gavin Douglas is doing this in 1513 and Edwin Morgan is the modern macker who has the wow factor. Jump forward, second stage of Scottish greatness and literary history in the 18th century, Ramsay, Ferguson, Burns. Ramsay putting an anthology together called The Evergreen, bringing those earlier poets back into currency, retrieving and renewing, as Edwin Morgan puts it. Ferguson, centering on Edinburgh. Fer Robert Ferguson is the great poet of Edinburgh. Anti-Dr. Johnson, anti-English superiorism, but concentrating on his own vernacular Scots language in the city of Edinburgh, and Burns, the great love poet. The, and, the, and, a, and a great poet of speed, um, the eldritch race in Tam O'Shanter. So the watershed of the union uh, of, the Parliament, of the crown in 1603, of the parliaments in 1707, these poets coming through in the 18th century. And then in the 20th century, Hugh McDermott in the 1920s, the whole world of Scotland is a multifaceted factor, multilinguistic, full of different territories. The poets of Morgan's generation, immediately after him, after McDermott, each of them having their own favoured territories, their own favoured places. Morgan in Glasgow and the world, Norman McCaig, Loch Inver in Edinburgh, Sorley MacLean, in Skye and Razzie, George Mackay Brown in Orkney, Ian Crichton Smith in Lewis, and then the generation after them, the generation that's with us now. Two aspects to think of, the 
the coming into prominence of women, particularly Liz Lockhead and Jackie Kay, as I've mentioned, but also Carol Ann Duffy and Meg Bateman, Jerry Fellows, Elizabeth Burns. These are fantastic poets. And a group, a little group of poets called, a poet called Richard Price gave the name of, the name to, of the Informationists. And the Informationists were Richard Price and um, Peter McCary, David Kinloch, uh, myself and others. But we were all part of this um, generation. And Liz Lockhead, particularly, I think, was a very close friend of, of Eddie's, who were encouraged and enabled uh, by Edwin Morgan. So Morgan's it's a, that transition, drawing from the past, pointing to the future, occupying his own uh, space with those priorities that we have now of ecology, gender and sexuality, language, Scotland and independence, they're all there in Morgan's work. So where does that place him in an international world? Well, if you think of the great poets of the early 20th century, the most familiar ones that are associated with the modern movement, modernism, W.B. Yeats, T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, Wallace Stevens, William Carlos Williams, and then coming forward, Adrienne Rich, Allen Ginsberg, uh, Robert Creeley and Charles Olson in America. Or in Russia, uh, Mayakovsky, the revolutionary poet that Morgan translated, um, but also Anna Akhmatova. And then more recently, Yevtushenko and Vozhnyshensky, whom Morgan also translated. And you think of those great translations from Hungarian poets. Never mind the Hungarian snake. What about Sandor Vyorys and Attila Yosef? These are great poets that he actually translated into English. In Africa, Wally Soyenka, the Nobel laureate of Nigeria of Africa, um, constantly engaged with the political world, trying to correct it. Um, in Australia, A.D. Hope and Les Murray, and in New Zealand, Alan Kernow and Bill Manhire. All of these poets throughout the world, um, in English and other languages, what are the main characteristics alongside which you can identify Morgan? Well, I would suggest five, and I'll, I'll come to an end with this. Firstly, an address to national cultural identity, an awareness of vernacular language, even in America using English. It's American English in William Carlos Williams. And it's politically engaged. It's about morality, actually. It's about what we're allowed to speak of. And that leads us to the second point, gender, and gendered and gendered and gendered nature of reality and sexuality as such. Adrienne Rich, preeminently in America, a fine poet um, addressing some of these questions, but there are many others, and Morgan is central to that whole history of understanding the range of sexuality, differences within sexuality and gendered identity that are part of the modern world and must be spoken of, must not be hidden or oppressed or concealed. Thirdly, play, just having fun with language, games, gamesomeness in Shakespeare's uh, word. It's very much there in New Zealand's poet, Bill Manhire. It's present to some extent in all poets, in all poetry. It's certainly there in Australia's Les Murray. Fourthly, revolution and love. The period of revolution that's there in Russia with Mayakovsky and in Hungary, in fact, opposed to oppression. And that opposition to oppression is what animates all of these uh, characteristics of the international poets, um, which, uh, which you can see wherever you look. And Morgan has that stature. He is alongside all of the poets that I've just named in terms of addressing each of these issues squarely and centrally and subtly and with nuance. And love underlies it all. And the last defining but undefining quality of Morgan which makes him actually different from all of these other poets that I mentioned, is diversity. He, Morgan, is more capable of writing more kinds of poetry, different kinds of poetry, than almost anyone I can think of. There are perhaps one, maybe two exceptions that I'm not going to mention. But I think it's, it's sometimes been said that that quality of diversity is itself a limiting factor and makes it more difficult for Morgan to be assessed. I don't think so. 
I think as you've, I think as soon as you say that that is a, a characteristic, that is a factor, then you've got something that is different from something that is unitary, or more singular, or more cramped, or or not necessarily in a bad way, more um, defined, more self-defined, as following a single purpose through. But Morgan, Morgan is trying things out in different ways over those five stages of his life that I try to describe, from literally from visiting Santa Claus in the north to we started with the Waitomo Caves in New Zealand in the south, from the USA to the USSR to modern Russia and virtual reality, from South America to Timor, from Nigeria to Venice, from Mungo Park to Pound and Stravinsky. Edwin Morgan, I think more than anybody, lived by the principle of the wee book there. Unknown is best. It's a big world, pilgrims. Take a big bite. Thank you.